بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so today we're going to continue with the journey of the soul in the barzakh and I'm going to jump in straight to our first issue where is the location of the soul in the barzakh where is it located and this question to be honest, even though it is discussed in our classical, some of our classical books, at the same time, Allah knows best, there seems to be a bit of a healthy skepticism that I think we should have because the whole notion of time and location and space for the barzakh is completely separate from our own world. We understand that time is different for the soul. And at some level, we also understand that the three dimensions is different for the soul. So this notion of trying to pinpoint where the soul is from our dimension onto their dimension seems to be a theoretical question. And that is why there is no one opinion. Actually, there are more than 10 opinions on this issue. And what difference does it make? It's even if we were to say the soul is located there, I mean, it's not as if we can go up to that location and have a conversation with the soul, is there? So even as I mention these opinions, I must say I personally feel a type of healthy skepticism that what is the purpose of this uh, discussion? There's no tangible benefit that comes from this one. Nonetheless, because it is mentioned in our classical books, I will mention some of these positions by first beginning to claim that Modern Western culture says the souls wander in this earth, right? The ghosts of the people wander in this earth. That we can dismiss categorically. That is completely false. The living and the souls are not in the same dimension. Now, whether they can communicate or not, that's next week, inshallah. But for sure, they are not wandering around in this dimension that we are in. And... Anybody who claims to see a soul, claims to see a ghost, quote-unquote, either this is imagination, or they are lying, and that is a logical possibility, or they have seen a jinn in, this, in the shape of a soul. It is not the actual soul of the person that is deceased. We do not see the soul of the deceased in a wakeful state. Whether we see them in a dream, we'll talk about next week, inshallah. But we do not see the soul in the wakeful state. Why? Because the soul is no longer occupying this dunya. So when we are awake, there is no question, we have no contact with the soul directly. And anybody who claims otherwise, we say, now you have gone against the ijma' of the Muslim ummah. Now, where is the soul located? I'll mention some opinions, and then I'll conclude and then move on to the next topic. I have two topics today, if we're able to finish them. The reason why there's a controversy where the soul is located is that there appears to be a number of reports that seem to have different categories for different souls. So for example, let's begin. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he's passing away, he's on the, he, Aisha radiallahu anha is holding him and his head is on her chest and he's breathing his last. Who can tell me, oh students of the seerah, what was the last words that he uttered in this life? Agreed, everybody? Right? What does that mean? What does Rafiq al A'la mean? The highest companions. Who are they? No. The Prophet is asking to be with Abu Bakr. That doesn't make sense. Allah and the angels Rafiq al-A'la The highest angels Rafiq is the contingent Rafiq is a group Al-A'la the highest group The Kiram and Katibin Safarat al-Kiram al-Barara The angels that are However you want to call it The ones that are the highest level They I want to be with Which indicates where is his ruh Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Up there With Allah and with the Rafiq al-A'la The Holy angels, okay? Now, the famous hadith that all of you know, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, all of you know this, that the ruh of the shaheed is where? Before that. Inside 
the bodies of green birds wandering around in Jannah looking at Jannah in one version eating of the hanging fruits of Jannah and perching on the chandeliers of Jannah but they are not actually in Jannah as a body they're in Jannah in ambience wandering around up there they're not living in Jannah they're flying in Jannah difference between the two okay they're flying means they enjoy the ambience of Jannah but they're not in their palaces yet they're not occupying their tents yet they're not with their companions yet they're not eating the food of the people of Jannah in one version they're eating of the grapes up there but not the food that is going to be presented in the platters as Allah says ala surur mutaqabilin they're not there yet so where is the soul of the shaheed and the green birds in the upper echelons of Jannah okay okay now the fact that the shaheed's soul is in Jannah automatically implies that other than the shaheed is not going to be there because if they were there then what is the purpose of the shaheed being told he will be in Jannah so you find here the Prophet and Rafiq al-A'la the shaheed in Jannah how about the rest of the believers? So here we get to, as we said, the number, a number of uh, controversies. The first opinion is that, and I'm just going to go over them quickly because in the end of the day, as I said, I don't find much significance in these different opinions. The first opinion, all of the souls of the believers, all of them are in Jannah. And the souls of the kafirs are in Jahannam. So they basically made qiyas upon the shaheed. And they said, if the shaheed has the green birds, maybe the other believers have something else. Okay? The fact that the shaheed has the highest level and flying around indicates from this group of scholars, they said, that maybe the other uh, righteous believers are also in Jannah. And to prove this point, they also bring a hadith that is another version of this hadith of the shaheed. Because the hadith of the shaheed says that uh, Ibn Mas'ud was asked, the famous uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari hadith, Ibn Mas'ud was asked, what is the meaning of the verse? Do not consider those that have been killed in the way of Allah to be dead. Rather, they are alive with Allah, being sustained by Allah. Ibn Mas'ud said, I asked the Prophet and we asked the Prophet about this, and he said, their ruh is in the body of green birds and they have uh, chandeliers that are coming down from the throne of Allah and they fly around in Jannah wherever they go and they then go and rest on those chandeliers now this version says the ruh of the shaheed and is very explicit because the ayah begins now other versions of this hadith reported and outside of the six books of them is Ibn Hibban uh, they say the ruh of the mu'min. So, does this mean that one of the narrators just made a mistake and reported by meaning? Or that the Prophet said the ruh of the mu'min? Because if he said the ruh of the mu'min, maybe we can broaden the hadith. And Allah knows best, it appears to be that this is from one of the second, third generation narrators. Because the context of the hadith doesn't make sense, the ruh of the mu'min. The hadith begins, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ لِنَا قُتِلُوا فِي سَبَلِهِ أَمْوَاتَ And even if the narrator says mu'min, the ayah indicates what is indicated by mu'min here is the highest level of mu'min, and that is the shaheed. Okay? So in reality, there is no, I would say, explicit evidence that indicates the believer's souls are in Jannah. You have these generic ones. The... Another group says that, well, if the Prophet ﷺ is fir rafiq al-a'la, surely those who loved him will be with him because those that love him are with him. Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. And so, they said, the ruh of the believers is, forget Jannah, we'll get a free upgrade. They are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even higher. Because the Prophet ﷺ is there. So we should all get a free upgrade if we love him. MashaAllah, very generous and we hope. But again, yani, the third opinion is that the ruh of the believers are in the plains outside of the gates of Jannah. So they are close, they see the gates, and they are just waiting for the door to open to enter. And the uh, kafir and munafiq, they are outside the plains of Jahannam. And again, there's no actual evidence, but it's just theories out there. Uh, the fourth opinion, I really like this one. They said that they are in fil mahd al adam. The, the, the quintessential no location. They are in no location whatsoever. 
right? They are in no dimension, nothing. And that doesn't make any sense because they're somewhere, even if it's Adam al Barzakh, but they are somewhere. The fifth look, uh, opinion Imam Malik said, I have heard Balaghani, yani some of the Tabi'un, Imam Malik is one generation between him and the Sahaba, right? Malik Nafi ibn Umar. His teacher is the student of the Sahaba. So Malik is one generation away. Between him and the Sahaba is one intermediate generation. So Balaghani, and this is famous for Imam Malik's book, there are many Balaghat, Balaghani, I heard. And when Imam Malik said, I heard, it's not a trivial I heard because he's living in Medina and his teachers are the sons of the Sahaba. His teachers studied with the Sahaba. So Imam Malik's Balaghani occupy a status in the, the science of Hadith. So he said, Balaghani, I have heard that the souls of the believers are free to roam wherever they want. So they're in no one location. They are free to go in the Alam al Baraza, wherever they want to go. They want to go up, they want to go down, they, they are free to go. The, what number are we on now? Sixth opinion is that Ibn Hazm said, Ibn Hazm wrote that the souls of the dead were where they were before they were born in this world. In other words, from the time Allah created the soul, remember we talked about this, up until their birth, they were in some location. Where they were, we have no idea. Then Ibn Hazm says, when we die, we will return to where we were. Right? So Ibn Hazm argues they're going to go back to where they originally were. However, firstly, there's no evidence for this. And secondly, the cumulative experience of men is that there seems to be some occasional connection with the arwah of the dead, as we know and we're going to talk about next week. Whereas there is no connection with the arwah of those that are not yet born. Right? So it does not seem to be a strong position that Ibn Hazm says, but nonetheless that is his uh, position. Ibn Abdul Barr, the famous Andalusian scholar, Ibn Abdul Barr, he said, he looked at these evidences and he said, the soul of the shaheed is in Jannah and the soul of the mu'min is surrounding his qabr. And this is, I would say, a, there is no one majority, but a majority position. A lot of ulama held this one, right? Because that's maybe what it seems like. Because the hadith of Bara ibn Azib, which we did multiple times, always brothers and sisters, remember the hadith of Bara, we said it is the fundamental hadith of this whole science, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, when the soul comes back down, it goes to its jasad. It goes back to its body. So Ibn Abdul Bar said, the shaheed soul doesn't go back down, it stays up there. In the green birds and the bodies of the other believers their soul comes and is in that vicinity from our relative perspective they're in that vicinity so this is Ibn Abdul Bar and I would say it is a majority position one can construct another position under this the souls of the prophets are higher than Jannah because Rafiq al-A'la the souls of the shuhada are in Jannah and the souls of the righteous are where their bodies are this is I think Allah knows best, it seems to be a reasonable uh, position. Uh, there are other opinions as well. Um, Ka'b al-Ahbar, uh, he was the son of a rabbi. And Ka'b al-Ahbar, if you know who he is, a very interesting character of early Islam. And he brings a lot of narrations from the Judeo-Christian sources because he was a scholar who was schooled in the other traditions when he converted to Islam and he began becoming a scholar. So he has a lot of knowledge of the other scriptures as well and folklore from his religion. And he would narrate a lot of things from there. And because he was so early, he was contemporaneous to Ibn Abbas. Ibn Ibn Abbas and him were a similar age. So he is of that generation, but he's not a Sahabi. So because of that, a lot of his narrations made their way into our tafsir literature. So uh, Ka'b al-Ahbar said, the souls of the believers are in Illiyin and the souls of the Kuffar are in Sijin. But Allah knows best, the verse in the Quran mentions that the Abrar, the righteous are up there and the evil are down there. And that's after Qiyamah, not before Qiyamah. Again, this is an opinion. And then there are many folklore, bizarre opinions that are found in some of the books. These are, these are fairy tales, these are myths. For example, the, 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 the souls of the believers are in the well of Zamzam. This is something mentioned in our classical books, right? Which is actually a bit freaky when you drink Zamzam, you don't want all the souls over there, right? But uh, this is just uh, any kalam, just there. Or the souls of the believers are a particular well in Damascus and the souls of the kuffar are a particular well in Hadramaut. I mean, this is just yani, empty um, kalam. Ibn Taymiyyah, he tries to uh, reconcile 
um, all of these things. And Ibn Taymiyyah has a position as well. And in his Majmur Fatawa, Ibn Taymiyyah, volume 5, page 144, he says, الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ So he follows the position, the righteous believers, they are all in Jannah, in the Barzakh, before Qiyamah. The arwah of the believers are in Jannah, even though some amongst them are allowed to come back to this world and their body here. And they can go up and down as they please, like when they were awake and they go to sleep, their soul goes out and it comes back down. So too in the Barzakh, they have that option as well. And this, he said, he said, is the position of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and many ulama, and they have evidences for this end quote. So Ibn Taymiyyah's position is interesting, and I'm sympathetic to it. Between Ibn Abdulbar, Ibn Taymiyyah, this is my position, and Allah knows best. And they're both similar, except that Ibn Abdulbar says each category will always be there. And Ibn Taymiyyah says it is possible for the soul to go in and out and uh, uh, move around, which is similar to Imam Malik as well, that the soul can go wherever it wants to go. In the end of the day, Allah knows best. We are, this is not something that we can categorically state anyway. And there's no benefit for us to know this. It's just a, 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 a hypothetical issue. And at the same time, at the same time, and we'll talk about this next week, inshallah. So all questions pertaining to communication and whatnot, this is going to be next week, inshallah. There does seem to be evidence and human experience that the grave, the sight of the grave, has something to do with the soul. Okay, so the cumulative experience of mankind, of visiting the site of the grave, and the soul being aware that the person has been visited, or the body has been visited. So Allah knows best, does this mean that the soul is maybe up there, but it has some connection with the location of its body? In the end of the day, it is alam al-barzakh, as I said in the beginning. So the whole notion that we can pinpoint, we can demarcate on a 3D chart, right? As if there was a radar scanner and we can follow the soul. No, the soul cannot and does not have a location like our bodies do. So maybe the soul can be in different places at the same time. Einsteinian physics, if you understand what I'm talking about. It's not something that is impossible, even from our minds to understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So that is the first topic for today. And we, uh, this topic we conclude, as I said, I'm sympathetic to both Ibn Abdul Bar and Ibn Tamiya's position between these two. And these are the majority. So these two are the dominant positions of where the soul is. Jayid. The next uh, topic now. The rest of today, inshallah, we'll try to finish, even though I doubt we'll be able to, but we'll try to finish that. We now move on to the very important topic which is, what are the specific causes of Adab al-Qabr that are mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah? This is a, as far as I can tell, an exhaustive list, and I always can be mistaken, and if you find other things, please tell me, and I'll add them to the list, but I tried to make this an exhaustive list with the condition. This is the condition I have. Firstly, it is authentic, and secondly, it is explicitly linking this action with Adab al-Qabr, okay? Because we begin by stating Generically, every sin is potentially punished in Adab al Qabr. Right? Generically, it is possible any sin can be punished in the Qabr. We're not talking about generic. We want to know what did Allah and His Messenger explicitly link to Adab al Qabr from for us to be aware of. And so, one of the reasons we should be aware of this is we need to be extra careful about these particular uh, sins. And we began by once again reminding ourselves I've done some of these evidences before, but the Adab al Qabr is something that is well known. And there is a very terrifying hadith in Sahih Muslim. Anas ibn Malik said, Anas ibn Malik said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Lawla an tadafanu, were it not for the fact that you would stop burying your dead. I would have made dua to Allah that you hear the adab al-qabr that I am able to hear. This is a terrifying hadith because he, we are being told if we could hear adab al-qabr, we would stop burying our dead. Were it not for the fact you would stop doing dafan of one another, 
then I would, made, I would have made dua. I didn't make that dua. But I would have made that dua to Allah that you hear the adhab al-qabr. Yusmi'akum min adhab al-qabr. That's what I am able to hear. And that is a very terrifying hadith. Imam al-Qurtubi begins this chapter in his famous book. And as I said, he has a three-volume book about uh, the uh, ahwal al-qabr and the mota and the barzakh. That he says that no, that the adhab al-qabr is not only for the kafir nor is it restricted for the munafiq. Rather, some of the believers will also be punished. A category, he says, that have done misdeeds and that have done sins that deserve this, end quote. Now, let us begin our list. Number one, which is the most obvious one, the kafir. And as for the kafir, and category two, which is the munafiq. So one and two, kafir and munafiq. These are the only two that are mentioned in the Quran, adab al-qabr. These are the only two categories that are mentioned in the Quran. There is no reference whatsoever of the adab al-qabr for the believer in the Quran. We only learn this from the sunnah. Okay, so the Quran indicates adab al-qabr for two categories. And I went over many of these verses in my, I think, first lesson or second lesson. Go back to that. And I'll just quickly go over one or two. As for the kafir, well, we have the hadith of bara because the Prophet ﷺ began the hadith with the uh, Muslim and then he said the kafir. As for the kafir, he sees the angels that are terrifying. And then he is hit and then this and then that. So the adab is right there. We see it in the hadith of bara. As for the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, Regarding the family of Fir'aun, النار يعرضون عليها غدوا وعشيا ويوم تقوم الساعة أدخل آل فرعون أشد العذاب. The fire of hell will be shown to them morning and evening. Then, when judgment is called, it will be said to them, "Enter the worst punishment." Again. Think of the verse, understand the verse. The fire of hell will be shown to them morning and evening, then when judgment is called. So when is the fire of hell being shown to them? Before judgment. What is before judgment? Barzakh. Right? Annaru yu'raduna alayha. They are smelling Jahannam, they're feeling Jahannam, but they're not yet in Jahannam. And that is a torture. Annaru yu'raduna alayha. It's being shown to them. Morning and evening. Then when judgment is called, it will be said, enter the family of Fir'aun, father and son, the worst of punishment. Also, Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, after mentioning Jahannam, then Allah says, and indeed, those that have done shirk, ظلموا here shirk, those that have done shirk will also suffer a punishment lesser than that. But most of them don't understand. They don't know that. Now, what is the punishment lesser than Jahannam? Right? They have something that is lesser than Jahannam. So Ibn Abbas said, it is the adab of the qabr. Okay, so we have evidences in the Quran that the kafir has adab al qabr. Jayyid. Category two, we said, was what? Who's following? By the way, I noticed many of you don't take notes. I'm wondering. Uh, uh, there's, uh, this, this is inshallah useful I'm just saying for your sake This is useful This is uh, th what my material It is not one book I compile it And it is something that inshallah Will be useful to those of you that are Because I know that none of you can memorize No matter how young you are You haven't memorized everything Just listening to a lecture And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Said hadith is in uh, Khatib al-Baghdadi's uh, book About knowledge Qayyid uh, al-ilm Trap knowledge They said how can we trap it Ya Rasulullah He said by writing it down So there's an authentic hadith That he commanded us to write knowledge down and it is beneficial also when you write down you will understand better also when you write down you memorize also when you write down you pay attention so just as a generic advice and there is no exam I'm not going to quiz you but just a generic advice that it's useful for you to have your own personal notes anyway so what was I saying um, the second category is nifaq and that is hypocrisy we said the Quran mentions adab al-qabr for the munafiq and again there are a number of verses and of them is surah tawbah Allah says in the Quran, وَمِمَّنْ حَوْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُوا عَلَى النِّفَاقِ لَا تَعْلَمُهُمْ نَحْنُ نَعْلَمُهُمْ The people around you, some of them are munafiqoon. These A'rab, the Bedouins, the A'rab, they are munafiqoon. You don't know them, I know them. Then Allah says, سَنُعَذِّبُهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَذَابٍ غَلِيُفٍ We're going to punish them twice. Then they will be given to the worst punishment, which is Jahannam. Notice, we will punish them twice. 
Ibn Abbas said, they will be punished in this world by being exposed and humiliated. Then they will be punished in the qabr, in Adabul qabr. Then they're going to be taken to Jahannam. Right? Sanu'adhibuhum, how many times? Marrataini, thumma yuradduna. Then they're going to go to Jahannam. So the second marratain here, so marra in, uh, marra in this world, the second time will be in the qabr. So this is also an indirect reference to adab al-qabr for the munafiq. Now, before we move on to the next list, the fact that the Quran only mentions adab al-qabr for the kafir and munafiq, and it is the hadith that mentions adab al-qabr for some of the sinful, just from this, insha'Allah, we can derive that the adab al-qabr for the believer is not to the level, not to the severity of the adab al-qabr for the kafir and the munafiq. Because that is the, the major adab al-qabr. That is the, the severe adab al-qabr. As well, the same thing applies to Jahannam, which inshallah, when we get to the topic of Jahannam, we'll also mention this, that a lot of people don't know this, but it's a very, not that it should console us because we don't want to go there, but the Jahannam that is prepared for the kafir is a special category of Jahannam. Anyone who worshipped Allah and powed down to Allah and disguised to Allah and said, La ilaha illallah, they will never, and they died in that state, they will never ever enter that level of Jahannam that is meant for the kafir. That is a separate category for the believer, and we'll talk about that when we talk about that. So again, the point being, when Allah Azza wa Jal only mentions the kafir and the munafiq in adab of the qabr, so we extract from this, their level of adab is totally different. And the believer, no matter what the level of adab is, it's not to that level that is for the kafir and the munafiq. Jayil. Now we get to, and we're not going to finish because it's a long list. So we said number one and two is kafir and munafiq. Number three, the number one issue mentioned for the believer, number three in our list, but the number one for the believer, and you all know this, is what? What is the most adab al-qabr possible for the believer? The number one category for the believer. For what sin? If it's shirk, then he's not even a believer. Not cleaning after using the restroom. Not cleaning after using the restroom. And they, there are many a hadith about this. Of them is the very, very famous hadith that our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed by. Hadith is Bukhari Muslim, Mutafaq Ali Abu Huraira, and others narrated it. Our Prophet sallallahu passed by two qabrs over there, two qabrs next to him, and he said, "Innahuma la yu'adzban, wa ma yu'adzban fi kabir. Bala innahuma la kabir." These two are being punished, but they are not being punished for big things. Then he said, no, they are big things. As for one of them, أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَكَانَ لَا يَسْتَتِرُ مِنْ بَوْلِهِ He would not protect himself from his own bowl, from his own urine. And the other version says, كَانَ لَا يَسْتَبْرِئُ مِنْ بَوْلِهِ He would not allow his urine to basically finish, uh, and so it would drop out and would leave Najasa over there. Now, uh, and, and our Prophet also said, let me finish some hadith and then we'll clarify. Um, in Sunan al a very interesting narration, authentic narration, that once our Prophet ﷺ needed to relieve himself, so he walked away, uh, the, uh, went away, and he went behind a, a uh, bush or something, and he sat down to relieve himself. And one of the munafiqoon made fun of this, and he said, look, he is urinating like a lady now pause here do we understand what is the mockery men you know in this culture right this is what is being made fun of by this munafiq okay even in their culture men would stand up and our prophet sat down so one of the munafiq a'udhu billah a'udhu billah and he just this is the munafiq what do you expect yani? he said look he is urinating like a lady this is not the way that a man should urinate so uh, uh when the Prophet came back, he was informed of this. And he said, do you not know what happened to the Bani Israel? They used, they were commanded by Allah, they used to cut off any cloth that splashed, that urine had splashed on it. Then one of them stood up and said, don't do this anymore. Keep that cloth on. Don't worry about it. And he said, Allah Azza wa Jal punished that man in his grave for stopping this practice of the Bani Israel. So the reason why our Prophet would sit down 
was because obviously when you stand, the chances of the urine coming back on you are more. Now, this is an advanced fiqhi issue. Is it allowed to urinate while standing? Large controversy. But in a nutshell, if you can somehow make sure it doesn't splash back and also somehow cleanse yourself. When you go to these restrooms in the public facilities, both of these are not usually possible, okay? But if these two conditions are met, then it is permissible because the reason why you should not urinate standing is mentioned in this hadith very explicitly. And that is that it will splash back on a man. So uh, the point being that our Prophet ﷺ explained that we don't want the urine to splash back on us. The third hadith we'll mention today, Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, be cautious and beware of your urine. لِأَنَّ عَامَّةَ عَذَابَ الْقَبْرِ لِأَنَّ عَامَّةَ عَذَابَ الْقَبْرِ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ Because the majority of عذاب القبر will be because of urine. This, this hadith is in Dara Qutni. And in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, our Prophet Sallallahu said, أَكْثَرُ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ The majority of عذاب القبر comes from urine. Now, let's explain. Why is this such a big deal? It is a big deal, as Imam al nawi and Qurtubi and others said, because it indicates a complete and utter carelessness about tahara. And tahara is the key to salah. And salah is the pillar and the crux and the backbone of all good deeds. So when a person becomes lax about tahara, this is a frame of mind that he's lax about Salah. And when you're lax about salah, then even if you pray, if you pray and you're not, يعني, right? even the one who's praying, but he's not praying the way that you're supposed to pray. So the one who is not concerned with bowl, we're not concerned with urine, bowl is urine in Arabic, the one who's not concerned with urine, and he doesn't care where it splatters, he doesn't care his clothes get dirty. This indicates and betrays a level of carelessness with the sharia of Allah, that, a'udhu billah, what do you expect then? So, we are told to be cautious, very careful of uh, being, taking reasonable protection. Now again, this is not the topic here, but in every book of fiqh and every book of adab, we also hear the exact opposite, and that is the waswasa of shaitan when it comes to tahara. We should be between the two extremes, right? We should not go to extreme about this as well. Take reasonable precautions, and as long as you are fairly certain that your clothes are clean, no problem. Don't let shaitan go and start driving you crazy. Maybe there's a molecular thing that splashed back. No, we're not having to deal with the molecular thing. Don't worry about that. You took reasonable precautions and you leave the rest. You know, don't let shaitan destroy your act of worship. The point being that uh, our Prophet ﷺ said, now back to the hadith, they are being punished for something that is not big. No, they are big. How do we understand this hadith? Right? He said, is this a contradiction? No. Our scholars have said, theoretically, technically, these are not major sins. They are not major sins in and of themselves, but they lead to major sins. Okay? In and of themselves, if you're careless with urine, in and of itself, it's not a major sin. But if you become careless with salah, that is a major sin. Another interpretation, and they're all valid interpretations in this regard, they're being punished for things that are not trivial. Sorry, they're not big. Rather, they are big. Meaning, they're being punished for things that if they just took a little bit of precaution, they could have avoided them. But they didn't avoid them. So they're not big in terms of protecting yourself, but they are big in terms of sin. So this is another interpretation, and both of these are valid. The point being that we should all remember this hadith, especially brothers, because generally speaking, we are the ones who are more careless uh, in this regard, that we need to be cautious about our urine. And by the way, if it so happens that some splashes back, then all you need to do is wash it. 
Alhamdulillah, we don't have the Sharia of the Bani Israel that we have to cut it off and get rid of that, you know. It's just washing it properly and then it is يعني, tahir. So that's not an issue. As well, by the way, if it's, and I'm just saying this even though there's a fiqh issue, but still, just because we're on the topic, if it so happens that you are forced to use the restroom in a public area and you're not able to uh, purify yourself in the proper manner. In this case, do not, yani make sure that you're able to get home and change your clothes and wash yourself before salah. So to be in a state of a little bit of najis on your clothing temporarily, that is not going to cause you any sin. The sin is to pray in that state. You see the difference between the two, right? So if it so happens that you are driving between two cities and you are not able to get a restroom that is clean and you just have to urinate and yani you're not certain that you, know, you were able to uh, protect yourself from whatnot and you have an hour left to get home whatnot, for example. So you just quickly go home and you just you know um, wash yourself and change clothes and you are not sinful the sin is not in having a bit of nejis on you for a period of time the sin is praying while that nejis is I'm just saying this so that we benefit from this okay so this is point number three kufr shirk and then number three is urine number four and then um, we'll see if we can get number five and then we'll open it for we can. number four the same hadith of the two that he passed by two people in the grave they're being punished for some things that are not big rather they are big as for one of them he, was, he would not protect himself from the bowl as for the other فَكَانَ yamshi bin namima. he would be walking between people with namima now in both of these cases these two people were habitual in what they did it wasn't a one-off at some level, may Allah forgive us, we all sometimes fall into this occasionally. Yani sometimes we cannot be careful and maybe some nudges falls. May Allah forgive us. Sometimes a little bit of ghima, namiba takes place. We all ask Allah's forgiveness. The adab al qabr is not for the one off from the hadith. As for the other, fakana yamshi bin namima. He made it his lifestyle. He was known to be tattletale. And what is namima? Namima is to hear something that is said about someone in one gathering and then to go tell him with the intention of making problems, causing issues between him and the other person. Okay? So Namima, Namma means to convey. In Arabic, Namma means to convey. So Namima, you convey something. But there's a technical definition. You convey what was said about the person to the person. So you're in one gathering and something was said that should not have been said. And that's basically ghiba. Jayid, the ghiba is bad. It's, it's, it's haram enough. But if the ghiba remains in that room, the damage is internal. When the ghiba is taken back to the person, this is called namima. And namima is worse than ghiba. Because namima is what ends up doing the damage. Namima is what actually causes the damage. As for ghiba in and of itself, that is haram. And you know what Allah says about it in the Quran. And the sin is between the person and Allah. But if that ghiba remains in that room, then it's not going to destroy the bonds. Namima is tattletaling the ghiba back to that person. Right? And this is uh, obviously haram. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith is in Sahih Muslim, لا يدخل الجنة نمام The one who does namima all the time shall not enter Jannah. And our Prophet ﷺ in another Hadith said, لا, لا يدخل الجنة قتات The one who breaks the ties between people shall not enter Jannah. So the one who makes it his habit that he wants to cause fitna or fasad or she wants to be the gossiper always tattletaling and talking about other people and whatnot. And this is a problem between men and women. A'udhu Billah. Both parties are guilty of this and it is not befitting the dignity of a Muslim to talk about the other people uh, firstly in their absence and secondly to then go back and tell them. In any case, the hadith says, as for the other, then he would walk around with namima. Now, if you look at this, the first guy was careless in the rituals, the bowl. The second guy was careless in personal akhlaq. And our scholars say this indicates overall that sins may be punished in adab al-qabr. The first person was careless in rituals, ibadat. The second was careless in mu'amalat. Breaking the ties of kinship. So this hadith indicates that the one who makes a lifestyle of being careless, because again, this is a lifestyle. This is a person who was always, he didn't care about bowl. 
had no concept of, of tahara. And the other one always kana yamshi bin namima. So this is number four. Number five, in one version of the hadith, uh, or a similar hadith, or a different one, we're not sure exactly. <coughs> Our Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he passed by two graves. And he said, as for the other one, he was somebody who would do ghiba. And ghiba and namima are two circles that overlap. Every namima has to have a ghiba. Right? So they're two circles that are similar. And in that hadith, he put two branches in the graves. And he said, and he said, as long as these branches are moist, their adha will be lifted up for them. And this is an evidence, we're going to come to this next week, that the adhab of, of the qabr for the believer can vary, can stop and can start. The adhab al qabr for the believer is not like for that of the kafir. The adhab al qabr for the believer can be temporary. It can also stop maybe even after a while. And in this hadith, it's taught for these two. One other thing we'll mention, and then we will uh, pause and continue back next week, inshallah. The sixth point, kibr or arrogance and pride. Kibr or arrogance and pride. And we know the hadith about arrogance. We know our Prophet ﷺ said, the one who has a mithqalu dharra, an atom's weight of kibr shall not enter jannah. And so many hadith about kibr. We also have adhab al-qabr linked to kibr. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, there was once a man who was walking in a cloak of finery, in a cloak that he's boastful and arrogant about, impressed with himself, having combed his hair finely, walking about yatabattar, and he means he has kibr in him. Like, you know, he has, he thinks he is it, right? And as he's walking around with that sense of pride, and Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْعَضِ مَرَعَ Don't walk around with that sense of pride. And remember Qarun and his story, right? Same thing over here. Our Prophet ﷺ said, as he was walking around with that butter, with that kibr in his heart, Allah caused the earth to open up and swallow him. And he will continue to be swallowed and descending until Qiyamah. Until Qiyamah means when is he being punished? Where is he being punished? In the Qabr. This is the punishment of the Qabr. Okay? So, the one who had kibr in his heart, A'udhu Billah. The one who had arrogance, this person as well, he has the potential to be subjugated to Adhab al-Qabr. And I wanted to finish, but we have too many. We have three, four, five other points, so we don't have time, inshallah ta'ala. So, any quick questions about what has preceded? If you have questions about what's going to come, uh, which is obviously the relationship of the living to the dead and the isal thawab to the dead. All of this is going to come, inshallah, in the next weeks. But anything that has preceded, let's talk about this, inshallah. Any questions? Yes, Can you have any uh, So our brother says that, uh, is it possible that the adab will be lifted from the one in the qabr because of a dua uh, of the living? And we will talk about this next week, but in a nutshell, yes. Inshallah. Yes, go ahead. If you cannot make it to your home, what is the uh, ruling? So if you are musafir, you are allowed to make jama'ah. So as long as it is from the first timing of the first prayer to the second timing of the second prayer. So dhuhr and asr becomes one time zone. Maghrib al-Isha becomes one time zone. So if you are traveling and you are able to pray within those time zones of those two salawat, then you are fine. But if you're going to pass over one time zone to the other, and this would happen, for example, Dhuhr Asr versus Maghrib Isha. So Maghrib today is what, 6.37? 6.37, right? So suppose you are driving back and it is 4 p.m. You haven't prayed Dhuhr and Asr, Right? You need to figure out if you're going to get home by around 6.15 or so, you are safe, inshallah. That's the presumption because you base the sharia on presumption. But if you're not going to get home by that time frame, you need to make sure that you're in a position to pray, which means you monitor yourself and your tahara and your body. Okay? Sisters, any questions from the sisters? Yes, go ahead. Uh, 
our sister is asking what is the Islamic definition of death especially when we have to talk about organ donation and when we can quote unquote pull the plug etc uh, the response to this uh, as somebody who is a member of the Fiqh Council of North America we have been discussing this topic for the last two years there is no clear cut Islamic unequivocal uh, position because all people of faith and even people of no faith they are dis discussing this issue when is a person technically dead there are certain things that are clearly pretty much considered to be dead when there's absolutely no brain activity no vital signs and there are certain things that are clearly not death and there is a gray area in the middle um, we are still in the process of releasing a fatwa about this but in the interim we are saying that if a group of doctors have decided that he is beyond saving. And this is typically an, a combination of brain death with one or two other things. That if a group of doctors say that this is now unfeasible, it is not typical for this person to come back. As for a miracle, we do not base our sharia on miracles, right? We do not base halal and haram on miracles. If Allah Azza wa wills a miracle, then he can bring the dead back to life. But we do not base rulings on miracles. So generally speaking, Generally speaking, when the vital organs cannot, organs cannot function on their own or when brain death has occurred, generally speaking, the fatwa is that it is permissible to withdraw life support at that stage. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Yes? How can the Quran what? How can the Quran um, uh, How can the Quran uh, help us in the barzakh? So the Quran can help us in the barzakh because the Quran is a shafir. The Quran intercedes. The Quran is the ultimate shafa'ah. In the hadith our Prophet said Al-Quran al shafi'un mushafa'ah. The Quran does shafa'ah. Shafa'a and its shafa'a is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shafa'a of the Quran is in this dunya, it is in the barzakh, it is on qiyamah. So this is how the Quran helps us. As well it is said that the Quran will bring nur in the qabr, even though it's not explicit, but the, the concept is there, it will bring nur in the qabr. Okay, yes, our young brother, go ahead. So our brother says that uh, when he's in school uh, and he doesn't have a water uh, to use, is it permissible to use only toilet paper? Uh, of course, the fiqh issue, and of course, we should all know this. Uh, by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam, there is no controversy at all. Can you believe this is something that is cultural in our minds? But none of the scholars of Islam ever said that it is obligatory to use water after uh, urine or even after defecation because most of the Sahaba did not have access to that much water that they're always using water the Sharia ah did not put a burden it is permissible to use dry material until no trace is left Okay, so we may wipe ourselves until no trace is left and in this case you don't have to do tahara that is tahara right there we are talking about bowl splashing back on you. That's what we're talking about, right? As for not using water, you are tahir, you are pure, as long as you wiped yourself such that there are no traces left, okay? Now, another thing that is practical advice, I'll, if you haven't been taught this, let me teach you this, and no problem. And there's no embarrassment in the sharia, we should learn this stuff. You can also take some tissues and make them wet under the under the faucet and sink, and then use that as a little bit of water to wipe yourself with, okay? So this is also something that you can use, but it is not obligatory to do that. And in case you cannot go outside and come back again, and again like there's a long line and you have to take your turn, for example, so you cannot go outside and come back in with the toilet paper or whatnot, no problem. As long as it is wiped and there's no traces left, you are pure in that state, inshallah ta'ala. Sisters, yes, go ahead. You already asked, but go ahead, no problems. Nobody else of the sisters is asking.
So our sister is saying, what do we make of those stories that the, the, the body has not decomposed and uh, uh, it is still in its original state? And the response is, this is something that is mutawatir. Every single person who deals with burials, every single person has seen and witnessed and knows this firsthand. And this is something that we authentically know from our own seerah with the feet of none other than Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. In the famous incident that is authentically reported and one of the most famous incidents of our history that the wall of Aisha radiallahu anha collapsed in uh, the 90s of the Hijrah. The wall collapsed because the wall of Aisha is a human structure. It's not something that is meant to be built forever. And a loud noise was heard outside of the Qabr of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was just a collapse that happened there. And so they had to come in and they had to uh, rebuild. Uh, and when the persons came, the, when the people came in uh, to rebuild the wall, they were shocked to see two feet. Original like no decomposition, fresh feet there. And the people almost had a heart attack because they were worried this might be the Prophet ﷺ and that is such an embarrassment and such an issue. But then they calculated and said, no, no, this is the third Qabr. It is the feet of Umar ibn al-Khattab. So 100 years or technically what, 80 years, 80 years, right? Yeah, 80 years roughly after the death of Umar al-Khattab, multiple people saw the actual feet of Umar ibn al-Khattab still completely there and that's when the structure was fortified and uh, no one has really entered that chamber except for Imam al-Saman Hudi in the 8th century which if we ever talk about the seerah or it's in my seerah lectures actually there but so this is well known it is true and it is inshallah ta'ala a positive sign okay yes go ahead Uh, so um, this is we'll do the final question inshallah so our brother is saying these punishments do they indicate that they will never enter Jannah and the response is no every believer everyone who says la ilaha illallah will enter Jannah right everyone who says la ilaha illallah with qalb with iman with ikhlas will enter Jannah these are punishments that insha'Allah ta'ala will take away from the punishment of the hereafter. So as for this person who was careless with bowl, in the end of the day he prayed. And his prayer is a good deed and his lacking of tahara is a bad deed. Right? So his prayer is a massive good deed even if he didn't do it properly. He deserves some punishment. But maybe he doesn't deserve Jahannam. So he is going to be punished in a way that is not exactly Jahannam. So it is not as bad as Jahannam. It is not there. But inshallah, the goal then is he will get rid of his sin so that on Judgment Day, inshallah, he'll be able to enter Jannah directly. Some group amongst them will also enter Jahannam, but then they will be forgiven and then enter, inshallah, Jannah. Inshallah. I apologize. Time is finished, inshallah. You can ask me privately, inshallah. We will continue next week. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.